We are rolling. Uh, I should have looked at that. Lecture 12, I think. Okay, good. Guessed at that one, right? First guess today. Um, I came across a problem that I thought would be worth our while to look at on arc length. Uh, we saw a couple of situations that happened yesterday. Arc length, length of a curve. Um, but this is um, an equation that's not solved for x, nor is it solved for y. And we kind of have to make that choice, whether we solve it for x and do dx over dy squared under the radical, or do we solve it for y and go dy over dx, the quantity squared. So um, let's take a look at this, a little bit different um, situation than we looked at yesterday. So we've got this equation of this curve. We want to go from 1 comma 2 thirds to 8 comma 8 thirds. So we don't have a parametric equation, so we can throw out that third type. So we know we're going to use either 1 plus dy over dx, quantity squared, integrated with respect to x, or 1 plus dx over dy squared, integrated with respect to y. So the question is, do we solve this equation for x, and then we differentiate x with respect to y, and throw it in this one, and put in y values, what would that be solved for x? And I'll stop when we get to the point where I think we have to kind of make a decision which way would be easier or better. This plus or minus the square root of 27y cubed divided by a. Okay. So if we just did the number stuff separately, we'd have 27 over 8, right? Um, we okay to keep just positives, right? Principal square roots because of where we are in the plane between these two points. And we'd have what? Y to the 3 halves because we're going to take the square root of both sides, right? So that's if we solve for x. If we solve for y, what would we get? Numerically, we'd have what? Cube root of 8 over 27? And never let the numerical stuff persuade you or dissuade you in one way or the other, because that's just a matter of pushing buttons anyway. Uh, and then we would have x to the 2 thirds. All right, so let's take a little hesitation here and see if we can make a decision um, which of these two methods we want to use. x equals this in terms of y. Okay. I, that would be my choice. Now, let's see if we agree on the reason why. Okay. Uh, let's <laughs> amplify that just a tad. What are we going to have to do with this? What's the next thing we do with this or with this? Derivative. Take the derivative. We've got, I don't, don't worry about the numbers. Just look at the y to the 3 halves and x to the 2 thirds. When you take the derivative of something to the 3 halves, what do you get? The one half. To the 1 half, and then what are you going to do with that? You're going to square it. Wouldn't that be nice? As opposed to when you take the derivative of something to the 2 thirds, what do you get? Of it in the denominator. Wait, no. Something to the negative 1 third squared, you're going to get it to the negative 2 thirds. Probably not as nice. This one is probably not going to be as convenient once we take the first derivative and square it as this one is. So if 
you've got something to the 3 halves, that's going to be a good one to choose. Take the derivative of something to the 3 halves, it's to the 1 half, square it, it's to the first. That's always going to be a lot easier to work with than something to some other power other than 1. So the derivative, we bring the coefficient along for the ride, and we add to it what? 3 halves? y to the 1 half. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do with that? We're going to take that, put it into here. We're going to square it. Uh, when you square a square root, actually let me just go ahead and write that down. We've got this whole thing. So we're going to go from 2 thirds to 8 thirds. Now let's go ahead and do what it says to do, which we think is going to be easier than the other. Squaring of something to the negative 1 third. So 1 plus this square root squared is just 27 over 8. This 3 halves squared is 9 over 4. And y to the 1 half squared, which is kind of why this method is going to work a little bit better, is y. So 1 plus any reductions anywhere? Don't have any, right? What's 27 times 9? 243. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. 243 over 32. Again, the fact that that's an ugly coefficient, we can deal with that. Um, what's the method going to be? Whether you do the method in your head or you actually write it down, what's the substitution? Okay, let u equal what's under the radical. Which means that du, since this is to the first, du is just going to be what? 243 over 32? dy? So do we need to make any corrections or compensations in the existing integrand? Okay, we need a 243 over 32. To get that, we multiply by its reciprocal to make that legal. So we multiply by 1. The purpose is that that becomes what? Du? Yeah. And this term right here is yeah. square root of u? To one Good. u to the 1 half. So whether you write it down or do that part in your head, um, we've made that substitution. Now we're integrating u to the one-half du. What's the integral of u to the one-half du? Two-thirds u to the Okay, we've got this out front. We're integrating, ignore the limits right now because those go for y, not u. Integral of u to the 1 half du is u to the 3 halves over 3 halves. And what is u equal to? A lot of ugly fractions, but at least the integration part, the substitution part, the actual integration part is not bad at all.
and when it comes to coefficients and all that stuff, we're eventually going to farm that out to our calculator anyway. So I think we have a doable problem, right? So the reason I thought it was worth looking at in class is that you can kind of anticipate if you've got an equation that's not solved for x, it's not solved for y, you can solve for either one. Anticipate what you're going to do with it after you take the derivative, which is square it. Kind of try to make it easier on yourself once you square that first derivative that ends up under the radical. Question about how to take this to a solution from this point. Okay, thought that'd be worth a couple minutes. You might think differently at this point, but I still think it's probably worth it to look at things that can happen differently in different examples. All right, last section that we'll cover prior to the uh, test, which is on Friday, has to do with um, average value of a function. value of a function. Isn't that a y value? Right? The value of the function is y value, so we want the average y value. And if you think of what a y value is on these pictures, a y value is from the x-axis up to the curve, so it's kind of like a height of that region. So another way to think of this is an average an average height. So we've got this region, got this function. And we're going from A to B. How many different Y values are there? Average value of a function, average Y value. Well, there's a Y value right here on the other side of A. There's another one right on the other side of that. Actually, I'm kind of leaving a little bit of a space, but there's one a whole lot closer than that. There's another Y value right here, another Y value right here. How many different y values do we have in going from A to B? We have an infinite number of y values. But aren't every one of these line segments that I'm drawing, aren't they all y values? So if we have an infinite number of these little line segments in going from A to B, we want to know what's the average y value, what's the average height. If you want to think of these as heights, this is a height. This is a height. These are all heights or y values, or values of a function. So in going from here, all these different heights or y values, to here, what's the average of those? So since there's an infinite number of these, we can think back to what we've done as far as representing one of the skinny little rectangles, or one of the trapezoids, or one of the parabolic regions, one of the solid disks, one of the washers, uh, whatever it is we're representing, one of the little hypotenuses, and then we add them all up, we're in a sense going to try to undo that process. So we've already added them up. We want to work our way back to what constitutes the average y value or the average height. So how, how do we add all these up? We've done that in this process by finding the area under the curve from A to B. That gives us, <clears throat> back to this picture, we want a bunch of skinny little rectangles. How skinny do we want the rectangles to be? Practically a line segment in thickness. How thick is a line segment? Practically zero, right? A zero thickness. So didn't we add up all these kind of skinny little rectangles with little increments of x along the way? from A to B by finding the area under the curve. So if that gives us the area under the curve, 
let's divide the area by the width, in fact, the entire width. What is the width in going from A to B? It's B minus A. So if we'll take this, which is the area, and divide it by B minus A, it'll give us exactly the number that we want. It'll give us the average height or the average Y value, because these Y values are really heights of the skinny little rectangles. That's how thin they are. That's how skinny they are. So if it is possible for us to find the area, or even easier than that, if we're given the area, all we have to do is divide it by the width. Does that seem logical to you, that if we take area and divide it by width, what should we get? We should get height, right? And we should, in a sense, get an average height. So back to our picture. The other one's kind of cluttered. So I don't know what the average height is, but let's say that um, let's say it's this distance right here. There's our average height. So if we take the average height so this I'll just call it F of C because that's what it's going to become in a couple minutes anyway if we take this average height times the width the width is B minus A don't we get the same area in this rectangle as is bounded under the curve. Does that look okay on the diagram? The area of this rectangle would be the same as the area under the curve. Now, if you divide both sides by B minus A, aren't we back up here to this? This point, by the way, would be C. So that F of C would be the average height or the average y value. So if the area of the rectangle, which is right here, equals the area under the curve, then we're in business. And that average height on this picture is the f of some c value somewhere between a and b. Obviously, it's got to be a continuous curve for us to even talk about this, but that's a point that's uh, well taken by the authors in this section. So if you divide both sides by b minus a, you're right back up here. So from the text, I don't think you're going to see anything a whole lot different here, but just to make it official, it's not just me writing some letters down. Uh, this is uh, the definition of the average value of a function on the interval from A to B. We'll take the area under the function, and we'll divide it by the width. Area divided by width ought to give you height. And a height is nothing more than a y value. That's pretty easy. Because we already know how to integrate and evaluate. All we have to do is divide it by b minus a, and we're in business. So let's see what a problem like that looks like. So let's take this function. And we want the average height on this interval from x equals 0 to x equals 4. We could draw a picture. You don't need a picture to do the problem. Sometimes it's helpful, especially in one of the first problems that you do. Um, what's this picture look like? What is this function? Parabola, tell me something about it. Opens down from what point? 8, 
right? So we come up here to 8, and which is where we want to start anyway. When x is 0, y is 8, and we want to stop it when x is 4. What's the y value when x is 4? <coughs> Zero. zero would be zero, right? So we're going. <laughs> okay, those are all the same. I think we got those answers in there. So we're going from zero eight, right, over to four zero. Is that our consensus? Okay, so we're here at four zero. So we've got this parabola that opens down, or really kind of half of that, because of our interval from zero to four. A lot of different y values in there. Y values from 8, and then they reduce to the right here, right in front of 4. They're practically 0, and then at 4, the y value is 0. So we want the average y value. So let's find the area under the curve. from 0 to 4, and do what with the area? Divide by 4, right? So we want 1 over b minus a, 1 over 4 minus 0. So we're dividing it by the width. It ought to kick out an average height, which is an average y value. So 1 fourth. Go ahead and integrate the integral of 8 with respect to x, the integral of minus 1 half x squared, still negative, x to the third over 6, I, think I heard that a couple times, evaluate that from 0 to 4, at 0 we're going to get 0, right? Mm -hmm. You put zero in in both places, you're going to get zero, so it just matters what we get when we put in four. Four. So 32 minus four cubed, 64 over six. So if we changed, well, we could, I guess, reduce that to what? 32 thirds? So 32 minus 32 thirds. Four thirds, is that right? And we'll take a fourth of that because we want to divide by the width. Sixteen thirds? Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Our low our highest y value is eight. Mm -hmm. Our lowest y value is just shy of zero. So is our average y value 5 and 1 third? Does that seem to mesh with the diagram? Mm -hmm. We have, if this were diagrammed accurately, don't we have a lot more larger y values before this thing starts to taper off? So even though we're going from 8 to 0, the average one is 5 and a third. So I don't know where 5 and a third is. Let's say it's right there. So the area of that rectangle, what rectangle? The rectangle that is 5 and 1 third units tall. And how wide would this rectangle be? 4. Is the area of that rectangle the same as the area under the curve? What was the area under the curve? 64 thirds, right? We take their product. Do we get the area under the curve? We do. Now, the, le the next topic in this section is now that we know how to find the average value of the function, which is not that difficult, find the area, divide it by the width, can we find the c value somewhere between a and b where the height is, in this case, 5 and 1 third? 
So can we find the number between 0 and 4 where this occurs? That actually is um, called something different. It's called the mean value theorem for integrals. The prefix mean means kind of middle. We're finding that value in the middle, not necessarily the arithmetic mean. There are lots of means. Uh, arithmetic mean is the average. What's a geometric mean? Anybody remember what a geometric mean? That'd be a good bonus question. Just, you know, I'll start doing that more often. Just put stuff from your mathematical past that are, you know, middle of the road kind of problems. What's the geometric mean of 4 and 9? It's a number between 4 and 9. It's not their average. That'd be the arithmetic mean. Anybody? Geometric mean. That's uncaring of me to ask that in it. Six years ago, I might have been able to answer. <laughs> Anybody? Geometric six. mean. Six. What if I told you it's six? So you knew that. How did you know it was six? I guess. You guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, one way is to set up a proportion. Four is to x is x is to nine. And then you end up with x squared equals 36. X equals actually plus or minus 6, but the only one that makes sense in this problem is 6, because we want a number between 4 and 9. So 6 is the geometric mean of 4 and 9. Another way, it's the square root of their product, right? It still is a number between them, but it's not directly in the middle. So don't think every time you hear the word mean, it's going to be, you know, right in the middle. It's somewhere between them. So we have a mean, sorry, I digress there with that, but, um, a, you know, every don't think mean means right in the middle every time. It means somewhere between A and B. So the mean value theorem for integrals, first of all, the function has to be continuous. Talked about that briefly. On the interval, we can't find the area under the curve if it's not continuous. So we've already done this part. We found the area. We've divided by b minus a. We know that's the average value of the function. Now we're going to call it the f of c, and we're going to search for c. So if that's the f of c, here's the picture that goes along with it. There's the f of c, that distance. Well, f of c is the average height or the average y value. So if we take f of c, the average height, now we're dealing with the rectangle, the f of c, and we multiply it by b minus a, we wanted the area of the rectangle to be exactly the same as the area under the curve. kind of hard to separate these two ideas, but we just go one step further with the mean value theorem for integrals. We go ahead and find c such that the f of c is this average y value or average height. So there's average height, there's the width, and with that the area of the rectangle should be the same as the area under the curve. Interesting little caption. This is taken from your book, uh, page 468. I don't always read the captions, but um, it says on page 468, underneath this picture, you can always chop off the top of the parenthesis two-dimensional mountain at a certain height and use it to fill in the valleys so that the mountain becomes completely flat. Kind of an interesting little picture, right? We're going to chop this off. Got a little deficiency going on here. We'll just take the chopped off part, pour it in here, and we've got a flat surface. Um, I actually did that. I was a part of that one time. That's why I thought it was kind of funny. Um, I went on a mission trip, 
we went to eastern Kentucky, a little town called Salyersville. Anybody ever been to Salyersville? No? Um, we were part of a crew that was helping to build a church, a huge church. So there were about 140 of us there for a week. And um, the church had purchased land down across the street from the existing church, and it went down toward a creek. And, of course, this happened after they purchased the land. They purchased the land. Then it was determined that they couldn't build on the land because it was they, they just couldn't do it. They had to fill it in. So they were going to have to buy. Here we are. Here's the church property. Okay. So they purchased, I don't know how many acres of land. Couldn't even build their new church on it. So across the street, this is very mountainous part of Kentucky. Um, across the street, they were widening the road on where the existing church was. Well, across the street from the church is this humongous mountain. So guess what happened? In order to widen the road, what did they have to do with the mountain? They kind of had to use some dynamite and get pieces, large chunks of the mountain out of the way to widen the road. Guess where the mountain went? So they took the mountain that they cleared the road. This was actually pretty cool that all this happened. So they widened the road. The state says, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Oh, why don't we take it right across the street and we'll fill in that land forget what it was, 133,000 cubic yards. That's a lot of stuff. So they go in, they get all this free fill in the lot, and they build this humongous church on this site in Salyersville, Kentucky. It's actually the largest building in the county. Um, but they were kind of stuck for a while. They, didn't, they couldn't build. So we get there, about 140 of us, and, and basically in a week's time constructed the their church on this land. So can you really move mountains? Yes, you can move mountains. In fact, they had church uh, shirts printed with all this, you know, with enough faith you can move mountains because it actually happened. Sorry, but I, I read that caption yesterday and I said, you know what, that, that actually happened. Uh, but anyway, so you can move mountains. So that's the next piece of the problem is we're going to find F of C. We're going to find C such that the F of C is the average height. Salyersville, Kentucky. Uh, we haven't had any trig for a while, so let's put a little trig in here. Used to have a daily dose of trig in 141. But it's simple trig. Sine of X. So we're going to find the C value such that the F of C generates this average Y value or average height. On 0 to pi would be very interesting from 0 to 2 pi uh, because the average height would be what? 0 because you've got as much positive as you do negative so this is probably a little more interesting from 0 to pi. So we've got this sine curve, this much of it anyway, from 0 to pi. We've got a whole bunch of different y values, starting with just barely larger than 0 up to the largest y value, which is 1, and then they start decreasing again. So we need to find the area under the sine curve from 0 to pi, excuse me, what do we want to do with that to find the average height? Divide it by 1 over, or divide it by b minus a, or multiply by 1 over b minus a, which is 1 over pi. So we're going to get the average value, and we know that that is going to be the f of the c value. And in fact, 
we might have two C values, right, in this problem? Two values between 0 and pi such that when we put those values into the function, they will generate the average height because of the symmetry that we have on either side of pi over 2. All right, integrate sine of x. What do we get? What's the antiderivative of sine of x? Negative cosine? So we want to evaluate negative cosine of x at pi and then subtract from that what we get at zero. So negative cosine pi, now that I know to evaluate at the upper limit of integration, which I learned yesterday in here, some of you were not very, very nice about that in correcting me, which I wrote that down after class. Negative cosine of pi. I wrote down your names. I know who you are. I do. I figure your grades, too. Negative cosine. What is cosine of pi? Negative 1, right? And then we want to negate that. 1. And cosine of 0 is 1. So we're going to subtract the negative of 1. So it looks like we get 2 over pi. Somebody that has a calculator out and working, what is 2 divided by pi? That's the exact average y value, but let's get a decimal approximation. 6, 3, 7. seven. So we've got a bunch of y values as we go from 0 to pi. Uh, but the, it looks like the average y value is a little more than 6 tenths, 0.637. So we want the f of c. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the exact value. We want the f of c to be 2 over pi. What is the f that we're dealing with on this particular problem? Sine of x. So we want the sine of x, and we're searching from 0 to pi. So we want to use our calculator as much as possible, not a common value. So this becomes a sine problem or an inverse sine problem? And it's an inverse sine problem. So x is the inverse sine of 2 over pi. Now, it's not going to give you both answers. But we can figure out what the other answer is from the answer that the calculator is going to give us. By the way, when your calculator is doing an inverse sine problem, it's choosing an answer. Anybody remember the restricted domain for inverse sine? That's why it knows to give you one answer when sometimes there are multiple answers. It's going to choose an answer from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, depending on what value you enter in. So we're entering in 2 over pi, and we're punching the inverse sine key. So this is going to give us the angle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 that has this value for its sine. That's too much information. So what is the value that your calculator wants to give you such that when we take the sine of that value, you might want to have your calculator working in radians too. If in doubt, on a calculus class, degrees or radians, always choose radians. Kind of a unitless description, whereas degrees carries that little small elevated circle up there. Radians, you don't need anything. It's just pi or pi over 6 or whatever. You don't have to attach a unit to it. What angle has pi over 2 for its sine? 0. 0. 0.690. And that's radians, right? I'll put that in parentheses. You don't need to say that. You don't need to write it. If you say 0. 0.69 and it doesn't have a unit, it's radians. So back to our picture. 
pi over 2, well, pi divided by 2 is about, what, 1.57? So this solution says that we need to go to about 0.7 radians, 0.69 radians. And we wanted the average height to be... What should that average height be for this problem? 0.637, over pi, right? So that rectangle, that is 0.69 approximately units tall, and pi units wide has the same exact area as is bounded under this sine curve. Is that true? So here's one of our C values. I'll call it C1. We could say C, the C that we're searching for, such that the F of C is the area divided by the width. Where's the other one? Pi minus point six nine. Exactly right. So this value right here is pi minus 0.69, right? Because of the symmetry of this sine graph and because of the fact that the sine is positive in the first and second quadrant and don't these both have a reference angle of 0.69, right? If you drew obviously 0.69 has a reference angle. Reference angle is between the terminal side and the kind of the nearest ray of the x-axis. So here the reference angle is 0.69. If you came over here to this angle, which is pi minus 0.69, so you go over pi and come back 0.69, isn't the reference angle also 0.69 radians? So we want those two angles, 0.69 and pi minus 0.69 because the sine, S-I-N sine, of both of these angles is the same, first and second quadrant, and they both have a reference angle of 0.69 radians. So find C. Actually, there's two possible C values. C1 is 0.69 radians. C2, pi minus 0.69. Either one will suffice, or it's probably good to go ahead and give both if there are two, like there are in this case. Questions on that problem? Back to the original picture. I guess we can use this one. What is that distance? Two over pi. And 2 over pi times pi, pi being the width, should give us the area under the curve. And I don't know that we ever found that by itself but because we'd already divided it by pi. But the area under this curve is 2 square units, right? Area under a sine curve, one branch of the sine curve is exactly two square units. Believe it or not, we usually go right to the buzzer in this class, but believe it or not, we're done with everything that we need to do today. How about that? Better write that one down. That doesn't happen very often. So I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>